There's far more disagreement about this than you might realize. In fact, I think if you were to ask the top 10 powerlifting coaches to each write a beginner training plan, you'd see dramatic differences between what they actually write. More on this later. The problem only gets worse when we talk about advanced training plans. We see pretty wide variation in between the plans, but this makes sense because individual athletes need different things. High-level athletes are trying to target specific weaknesses, specific ranges of motion, and so on. Okay, what am I talking about here? Advanced lifters need advanced training plans, or at least that's the illusion that I think most of us operate under. And beginners need beginner training plans, right? But what actually makes a training plan a beginner training plan? What makes a training plan advanced after all? Are we looking at different amounts of training volume, different exercises, different frequency, different volume? What is the difference here that we're really looking at? Maybe you think that beginners should do less work because they can make progress quicker on less training volume than more advanced athletes can make on more training volume. Or maybe you think that beginners need high specificity. They need exercises that are basically just the squat, the bench press, and the deadlift because they don't need advanced variations, they just need to practice the main lift in order to get stronger. Why complicate things with special exercises when simply squatting, benching, and deadlifting will do? Today I want to answer three questions. Question number one, what actually is a beginner? Question number two, what's the difference between a beginner training approach and an advanced training approach? And finally, question number three, how should beginners train? If we can answer these, I think we're going to have to pass through a lot of background on volume, frequency, intensity, and what actually makes a training program. Finally, I think we'll come back to a really satisfactory answer that I hope will surprise you. Ah, yes. As usual, it's a good idea to define some terms to get us on the same page. When talking about beginners versus advanced athletes, we're really talking about two things, training age and relative strength. An eight-year-old could be a beginner. A 40-year-old who has never touched a barbell could be a beginner too. A 25-year-old who only ever did bodybuilding until age 16 could also be a beginner. Someone who has trained incorrectly for two years could also still be a beginner. We could view someone returning from an injury as a beginner too. Likewise, advanced athletes come in all shapes and sizes, and it all depends on how we define things and what we look at. As is the case with many things, what we're looking at isn't black and white. We should view most training concepts as probabilities, as gradients with more or less likelihood across each of the training ideas our attention is presently placed on. Beginners tend to have lower training ages. This is the time spent actively working on getting stronger and relative strength. Compared to their body weight, they have a lower relative strength. There's quite a few ways we could measure relative strength. We have Wilkes score, the newer dots coefficient, allometric scaling, IPL good lift points, or even multiples of your body weight lifted, like a two times body weight deadlift or a six times body weight total. But at its simplest, it's just about comparing how much you can lift and what you weigh. If you can either lift more or weigh less than your peers, you're probably a more advanced lifter. Okay, so let's define a beginner in relatively agreed upon terms. A beginner is probably someone who hasn't been training like a powerlifter for more than six months, or has a Wilk score below 300, or is age 15 and under regardless of strength. People with either a low biological age or low training age can be classified as a beginner. Beginners lack basic coordination in the specific movement patterns powerlifting requires, even if they might have higher general athleticism. Or they can move those patterns, but not under loads close to their maximum. With that out of the way, let's start to understand training approaches generally. What we're trying to do is classify training approaches here. It's the unfortunate truth that in order to answer this question, we need to back up and talk about quite a few other training concepts. Deciding what the status of beginner and advanced training plans are means we need to look at the concepts of training volume and individualization, hypertrophy, specificity, whether or not long-term athletic development is actually a thing, and even the role of targeted exercises to improve weaknesses. Man, I really tend to take what should be a short question and just blow it up. Let's start with a little game. I'm going to remove the weight on the bar in a sample week for six training plans. So you'll see either RPEs or percentage of 1RMs instead. And I'll also standardize how assistance lifts look. So I'll say lat movement or shoulder movement instead of a specific exercise. You have 10 seconds to look over this sample training week and answer the question. 
does this training program belong to a beginner or an advanced athlete? How about this one? And this one? Okay, two more. How about now? And now? Okay, so let's review. What information did you use to decide if something was a beginner training plan or an advanced one? Was it how specialized the main lift variations seemed to be? Or maybe it was the overall number of sets, the volume the athlete was using. Could it have been the number of training days, specificity? Or did the program just seem to be designed for one person? Sets of seven reps is kind of weird, right? I'm playing with you here, and I know I'm playing with you. Now let's see who's really behind these bandages. Dr. Najib! I've asked some of my strong friends to send me some sample weeks and filter those in with true beginner training approaches. We're looking at a regular week of training for some advanced athletes to prove a point that I hope to only make stronger as we go along. What a beginner training approach is, is context sensitive to who is running it. All training approaches are individual and some beginners need more volume than others. They need different exercises or different lift frequencies. Advanced athletes sometimes respond very well on what looks like a beginner powerlifting plan. Often the only difference between beginner and advanced training plans is the load on the bar. An advanced athlete might do sets of five with 560 pounds, while a beginner might use 160 pounds or less or more, you get the picture. A few other ways to look at this. Once you nail the athlete's rough training volume needs, the main thing that changes between beginners and advanced athletes is load. I used to think that advanced athletes were doing crazy amounts of work and that their exercises were somehow different than a novice's. Now, I don't wanna throw us into some type of training nihilism here, that there is no such thing as a beginner training approach. I think there is at least a higher probability of beginners needing less work to make progress, of needing less of everything to make more progress. Less sets per week, less training complexity, less exercise variation, fewer days per week. The case isn't as clear for what advanced athletes might need. Should training volume increase over time as you get stronger? Yes, but mostly as a byproduct of the load on the bar. Some examples, just like we already saw, a beginner might do three by seven with 125 pounds. An advanced athlete might do a three by seven with 535 pounds. 2,625 pounds of volume in the first case, 11,235 pounds of volume in the second. Same training prescription. And this is why tonnage, that's total pounds or kilos lifted, is relevant, but not that useful. Number of lifts, NL, or sets times reps, or 21 in this case, three by seven, 21, is more useful because it allows us to compare between training approaches and why just total number of hard sets per week can be a pretty good indicator of what a training approach actually is. It allows for better comparisons between training approaches. And there's also a relatively unanswered question about the arrow of exercise specificity for beginner to advanced athletes. In other words, should beginner athletes or advanced athletes do more special exercises? On the one hand, beginners probably need to use specific exercises to learn certain parts of the lift better. Use a pause squat because it helps you understand tightness, bracing, and stability. Use a one and a quarter deadlift to transfer the skill of a starting position to full reps. Accommodating resistance to learn to push hard all the way through to the finish of the lift, and so on. There's correlates in so, so many other sports. In volleyball, where I spent a lot of time coaching athletes and as a setter and right side hitter myself, you break down a complex movement into constituent parts, learn the parts, and then piece them back together. You don't just say, go jump up there and hit the ball. 
go make sure that when that dude hits a ball, it's not gonna touch the floor. We build skills here and we build them out of small pieces that ultimately accumulate to the skill that we really want. On the other hand, you might think beginners just need to squat, bench, and deadlift. Why complicate things when they can make rapid progress on the main lifts alone? Shit, we might not even need accessories at first. Let's just hammer main lifts and see what happens. Have them practice the skill of squatting and they'll get better at it. When you look around, you really see that beginner programs are mostly just competition squat, competition bench, competition deadlift. So they must have things right, right? Well, opinions differ dramatically on this. And as far as I'm concerned, I haven't seen a consensus here, despite the research on long-term athletic development, suggesting young or new athletes have a wider array of skill practice and training types and intensities. The research on periodization, by the way, is fraught with suggestions that don't seem to be backed by any actual science. Praise our Lord, almighty savior, John Kiley, for showing us the way. All right, let's mix it up a little bit. Let's keep it going, feeling good. All right, so let's do a bunch of searches online and find all the most popular beginner programs out there. Download, download, download. How many sets are they suggesting an athlete does on main lift per week? Record. How many total sets per week? Record. Boom. What do they say about assistance work? Got it. Specificity. Days per week. Okay, summarize and here we are. The top 15 beginner powerlifting programs in review. All right, well, what do we see here? We've got 15 programs. We've got um, 3DMJ's program. I pulled a bunch off of uh, searches for best beginner powerlifting program and really try to get a mix of the most popular ones available. Here's some ones from Reddit, Ivysaur, Grayskull, GZCLP, Nsuns. We've got 531, Mad Cow 5x5, Candido's program, um, Powerlifting to Win by Izzy Narvaez, two programs there our own TSA beginner approach, Shaco's novice routine. And of these, I took a look at all the sets per week, total sets per week, assistance movements per week, and then a little bit on program design. Were the reps low or high on average? What's the specificity? What's the number of days per week? And let's just take a look at what happened here. All right, first thing we wanna see in this summary section is that the lowest number of squat sets was three, the highest was 17. That's a enormous difference between them. If you were to just toss a coin and run one of the top 15 programs, you'd have no idea whether you were running something effective for you or not. There's a 566% difference in squat. This is mirrored in bench press and deadlift. It only gets worse. There's an 866% difference in bench number of sets and a 1700% difference in deadlift. One training approach had only one set of deadlifts per week. Another one had 17 sets per week. The averages for this turned out to be nine sets per week on squat, 10 sets on bench, six sets on deadlift. And if we look at the mean, it's a little bit lower than that. Eight sets on squats, nine on bench, and four on deadlift. I think our own program here clocks in just above on squats at 10 sets per week. We have 14 sets on bench press owing to higher skill practice on that and eight sets on deadlift. Now. I know that no, total number of sets per week doesn't tell the whole story. We really need to take a look at the load on the barbell and ask ourselves how fatiguing is a program. Nevertheless, hard sets per week is a pretty good place to start when analyzing programs as a whole. This gets worse for assistance lifts too, anywhere from three to 19 sets of assistance lifts per week. And we can see how difficult it would be for beginners to really find an approach for them. There's differences in specificity as well. Most were mixed, to be honest, a few low specificity, one high specificity, um, and the reps were pretty mixed as well, um, with a few clocking in as very low and a few clocking in as very high. One training approach had five days per week. Uh, I would say of the rest, about half were four days per week and half were three days per week. Okay, what the hell is going on with this variance? If you're shopping around, well, not shopping because almost all of these are free, and you choose one or another of these, do you mean to tell me that you might end up doing 600% more work than if you chose a different training approach? Uh, what? Okay, so side note, I think that oftentimes when people write beginner training programs, they're rehearsing a complex interplay of what's worked for them. The history of every beginner training approach they've ever seen. Creativity isn't about creating things from scratch, but about mixing old things in new ways. The current meta of defaults for volume, intensity, and training frequency in an ever-changing pendulum that often swings back and forth. 
more on this in another video. Uh, exercise science, assumptions about the avatar of who they're writing for, beginners need X, beginners need Y, perhaps even a desire to differentiate from what's already been written, or maybe that precedes the writing itself to feel that you have something unique to add. And it's this that leads us to an extremely useful idea here, individual differences. People are different, not like humans and monkeys different, but even among human populations, people differ dramatically in their responses to the same training approach, or the same person can respond dramatically differently to two different training approaches. So in the above beginner programs, you will always find someone who crushed it on one of these training approaches and sings their praise, but you won't find a single training approach that works for everyone. I won't take credit for the real work done by Greg Knuckles and the team at Mass here for collating the extant research on individual training differences that first blew my mind in 2014 when I started reading about this stuff. As a side note, if you're wanting to learn more about this, much of what I know comes from the monthly study reviews that Mass, monthly applications in strength sport, a stellar review of nine or more comprehensive study reviews per month, along with audio roundtable discussions, audio versions of these study reviews for your morning commute or train ride of choice. I've linked a free best of issue and an affiliate link if you're interested in learning more about exercise science and strength training and staying up with the changing landscape of the science. Anyway, individual differences. It turns out we differ dramatically in our training needs. Study review time. The short answer is that some lucky individuals can get stronger on less work and others need to grind to make small amounts of progress. As Knuckles points out, even after controlling for height and weight, genetics still explain about half the variation in lean mass. Nature or nurture? It turns out that it's some of both, but that also means some people have a leg up before they even start working out. This is illustrated by a few fantastic studies. In one, a bunch of people trained bicep curls and tricep pushdowns over 12 weeks. By the end of it, on the same training approach, some people increased bicep size by 19%, while others increased by 54%. The key point here is about outliers. Humans fall along a pretty smooth distribution curves for training responses most of the time, but there are people at both tails. People who actually got weaker while training, and those who got stronger on bicep curls by 250%. Similar stories were observed in a lower body study which took things a step further by splitting people into groups of non-responders, moderate responders, and extreme responders. Extreme responders continued to make progress after the first eight weeks, where the non-responders didn't. If you're sitting here on the toilet watching this video and thinking, dang, I must be a non-responder, it might be the case that non-responders actually do respond, but just that they aren't doing the right type of training. A freaking awesome study compared people's responses to four training protocols, measured their acute testosterone responses, and then put them on the training approach that gave them the best acute testosterone response after which people made better progress than the other approaches. The four approaches were three sets of five at 85%, four sets of 10 at 70%, five by 15 at 55%, see the low percentage of 1RM there, and four sets of five at 40%. This is the easy route. Now again, it's not that one of these is better than another, it's really about finding the one that had the highest acute testosterone response. What can we learn from this? Well, it'd be really interesting to be able to measure acute testosterone response as a coach and use that to customize training. But what we really learn is that customization can lead us to very useful places. That individualization is real, that more volume isn't always better, and that it's about finding what's right for the person we're working with. There's likely more at play here behind the scenes than purely testosterone, so let's not get carried away here. Things like stress, stress reactivity, gene expression like the ACTN3 gene, the amount of muscle fibers you're born with, and this is all assuming that you're behaving like a perfect athlete in a vacuum with optimal nutrition and recovery. So we've learned that people need to training differently, not only as advanced athletes, but all the way down to the beginner level. An approach that works for one person is too much for another. A different approach is way too little. The last question I said we would answer is about how beginner athletes should actually train considering all of this. To do that, we have to look at long-term athletic development. Is it a thing? What's the interplay between training, fatigue, dropout rates of athletes, amount of time you have in your schedule, skill acquisition, and more? What about the role of hypertrophy, even nutrition? All right, let's get into it. Next time.